Hello, wonderful horror on sea. Um, it's brilliant to be back. I love doing these things. And uh, we've done quite a few now. I was kind of counting this up. Uh, this is the eighth one of these uh, kind of hour and a bit shows that we've done. Uh, we've done one a year. We've done six of them. The premiere at Horror on Sea. So this is the first uh, performance performance uh, ever anywhere of this new one, which is called Fear and Film. So uh, we will be talking about fear. We will be talking about fear actually quite a lot. Uh, but we will also, of course, be talking about film. And it's the film element that really ties in with those bits of paper that are floating around. Because what we're going to do in the course of this show is we're going to kind of crowdsource a pitch. Uh, we're going to crowdsource a pitch for the most terrifying movie ever made. That is our plan. Silence. The most terrifying movie ever made. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn it into a pantomime if it fucking kills me. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we're basically going to put together this this pitch for the most terrifying movie ever made. Ooh. Oh, excellent! I thought I'd be pushing my luck going for twice, but no. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to get something that's put together by everybody. So please don't be afraid of uh, writing on the forms because ultimately you will not be responsible for what comes out at the end. We're going to kind of crowdsource that bad boy. Um, some of you may be wondering who the hell I am, um, so I'll just very, very quickly kind of go through that bit. Now, the thing is that having done, as I say, this is like the eighth one of these shows that we've done, I'm always very aware of the fact that some wonderful folks, I see the same faces like every year, and so I'm really trying not to repeat myself, but then for a lot of other people, they're like, I have no idea who this dude is, but you know, we've seen a lot of films, so fuck it, let's just do something else. Um, so I'll just very, very quickly summarise why I'm here and uh, blathering at you. Um, I, I didn't get on very well in school, I didn't like school very much, and it was largely because I loved movies, and I wanted to study movies, and I wanted to get into movies, and I wanted to make movies, uh, and that was what I felt like my whole uh, life's mission was going to be. But uh, that wasn't, you know, really the immediate way that I went after school. You go out, uh, you go to school, you go to university, you study film then, and you know, that was great, and then you come out. And I worked uh, on, as a runner, uh, working unpaid on bigger shoots, um, and never really got anywhere. And then one day in uh, 2003, um, I suggested to my dear wife Pippa, um, maybe we could make a movie. We had a few grand in the bank, uh, which was actually meant to be going towards buying a new car, uh, but I thought it would be more fun to make a splatter movie in a shed in Shoebury Ness uh, rather than buying a car. And because my wife is the greatest human being in the universe, she actually said, yeah, all right, <laughs> let's do it. Um, so we did. So we made, uh, I've, I've got a lot of DVDs here. Where, oh, there it is. I made something called Trash House, uh, which was shot, as I say, in a shed in Shoebury Ness and ended up getting distributed all over the UK in every blockbuster. Remember Blockbuster? Oh, remember Blockbuster? Okay, you see, if the pantomime thing doesn't work, I'm just going to go into bad observational stand-up. That's basically where we are today. Um, but hopefully you remember Blockbuster. And yeah, Trash House came out, and it kind, of, uh, it kind of went everywhere, which was brilliant. So, fueled up by that, we went and shot uh, two more movies back-to-back, -back, which were Hellbride and Killer Killer. Uh, then the following year, with the money we'd got left in the budget from doing those two back to back, uh, we made a movie called The Devil's Music. Now, The Devil's Music was made for under a tenth of what we'd blown on Trash House, uh, and it was the best thing I ever did. Uh, the Devil's Music is, I still think of as being my best movie. It's the one I'm proudest of. Um, and yeah, it kind of, I think one of the underlying themes of everything we're going to talk about today is it's not necessarily having things, it's what you do with the things that you have. And that was certainly the case for me. So after The Devil's Music, we went, uh, we did a couple of anthology movies, which were co-productions uh, with a company in Southampton. And then I kind of moved more into the screenwriting side of things. I worked on a couple of projects I don't talk about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and on and on it has gone. Um, so yeah, that's me. Anyway. Let's move on and have a look at the little sheets that uh, you've got. Now, there's a bunch of boxes on them. And as I say, if anybody does need uh, pens, they're all up the back. Now, in the first one of the empty boxes on this sheet, what I need you to do 
is write your greatest fear. Now, really what we want is not, not something like massively abstract, not like the kind of the death of a loved one or something like that. We want more concrete things like kind of clowns or evil magicians or, or stuff like that. Something that could potentially be a threat in a horror movie. So that's what we're looking for. So if I could ask as many of you as can grab them, as many as you have pens uh, and whatever, if you could complete your greatest fear, maybe your greatest fear from childhood, if you're just nails now and you're not scared of anything, maybe think back to when you were a kid, the things that terrified you then. Uh, so we just need a fear. And you're not going to have to own up to it. Don't worry, no one's going to... Uh, probably. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, you're probably not going to have to own up to it because uh, we'll be passing them around later. But, but write it down and just hang on to it uh, for a moment. So, yeah, as I say, like clowns or evil magicians. We are actually going to come back to evil magicians later. So um, that's an interesting example. But, yeah, uh, as everybody who may write one of those, written one. Fantastic. That exercise, the idea of writing down the greatest fear, particularly the greatest fear that you associate with childhood, uh, as I was going through and we were kind of planning stuff out for this, just doing that exercise reminded me of something. Uh, it reminded me of the early 90s when there was a spate of interactive VHS board games. I'm really hoping someone in the room knows what the hell I'm talking about. Atmosphere. Thank you! Yes! Uh, <laughs> that's the boy. That's the exact classic one that we've ripped off. Homaged! Homaged! That's the one that we've homaged today. Okay, the idea, if you never got to play them, they're bloody brilliant. And nowadays, you can get the set uh, like on eBay or whatever fairly cheap, and all the videos are up on uh, YouTube. So you can still play along with it in the 21st century. But back then, it was a VHS tape. You whacked the VHS tape in the player. You played this board game... And this host popped up and kept kind of interrupting you. Um, and in the spirit of atmosphere, um, we're kind of going to do something similar to that today. Paul, could I ask you to um, kill the lights, please, sir? Um, yeah. Because the first thing that it always came up on any of those games was turn down the lights and turn up the volume. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, this goes up to 99. So let's see how loud that bugger goes. Oh, oh shit, that sounds bad. <laughs> All right. You may need to interact. Sorry, I should have told you before, but you, you may need to talk to a telly. find out just how much you really know. I am the Scissors Man. You won't know why I'm called that, but I think you can guess. Snip, snip. If at any point over the next hour I call on you to speak, you will respond with the following words. All hail the Scissors Man. Those words, and those words alone. Now let's try it. Um, you, the host. Yes, you. Speak. Uh, scissors man. Um, okay. I, I... Uh, you've already forgotten the simple command I gave you. <laughs> it's very simple. How can you expect these people here to trust you if you can't even follow a simple instruction? When I command you to speak, you I've respond with the following words. All hail the scissors man. Now let's try this again. Speak! All hail the scissors man! Oh, well done, you've done it very well. Congratulations, you can string your sentence together. Which might come as a bit of a shock for those people that caught your horror on C show from 2014. <laughs> now, subjects. You will have already completed the top field of the parchment that's been circulating. You will have put down your deepest, darkest fear, and you will have done this because you are idiots! Idiots! You don't tell the scissors man of your deepest, darkest fear. I bet you think you're all smarter than the actors or characters in horror films, aren't you? Hmm? 
Yeah. Let's see. Host! Yes, host. Yes. Go and grab one. No, don't skip! <laughs> don't skip! Hurry up! What? Hey, what? what do you want? Who spoke? Thank you. Thank you. Read it aloud, please. Um, demon under the stairs. Oh, bloody hell, that's useless. Okay, um, tear that one up. Oh, tear it up, sorry. I'd like to throw it into the air like the stones at the end of the goodies. Um. What was that? I said like at the end of the goodies. That was pathetic. Audience, take the sheet of paper you have in your hand and swap it with someone else in the room. Either in the right front of you or behind you, I don't care. Just make sure you don't end up with the same piece of paper in your hand as before. And when I return, I want you to be ready. In your host, speak. All hell, the scissors man. Getting better. Not bad. Now you've seen the idiot host him a few times, let's try it once again with everybody in the room. Remember, all hell the scissors man. Speak! All hell the scissors man! Mark, that was weak. I'll be back. But you better be ready. So that's the scissors man. <laughs> Alright. Um... I'm going to talk a bit about various things. Uh, I think some things connected to movies, some things connected to fear. The Scissors Man will, as you've probably gathered, regularly interrupt me unless the DVD fucks up, in which case we'll all just leave and cry. Um, I really like reducing big stuff down to smaller ideas. I like uh, breaking down movies into log lines, tag lines, stuff like that. It, it's something that appeals to me, and I think as a writer it's a really, really good discipline as well, which meant that um, a little while ago on Twitter there was a hashtag uh, that was hashtag uh, six word film plots and I got really into six word film plots um, so just to kind of kick us off and to check that this is the right kind of crowd um, it, a couple of ones that I did for that um, I'm not going to be gauche enough to ask for laughter because that's not really what we're after but if you could make some kind of noise if you know what the movie is that we're summarising here. Um, I like this one. Uh, so six word film plots, condensing them down. I liked uh, elaborate menstruation metaphor, ruins everyone's prom. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> this one, uh, this one I'd actually completely forgotten about till I looked back through the thread. Um, love conquers vampirism, also apparently feminism. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and and adolescent swears, masturbates, vomits. Priests overreact. <laughs> I've got the right audience. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So stupid examples out of the way. Uh, I do genuinely want to talk to you about fear. Now I've actually got a complicated relationship with fear. Partly this comes about just through being a horror screenwriter, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but recently I've tried to change my relationship with fear. I've kind of taken active steps to try and shift the way I look at stuff, and so we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit. And I should say that every single thing that you're going to hear over the course of the rest of this show is true, except there is one lie. Over the course of everything I'm going to say, I have put in one lie. So see if you can spot that as we go through. Um, there is a really cool Doctor Who episode, which some of you may have seen, um, called Listen. And in Listen, there is a line that argues that fear itself is a superpower. And I love that idea. That was just one of those lines that just kind of jumped out at me. I thought, oh man, I really wish that that were uncomplicatedly true. And I think sometimes it can be, and we'll talk about that. But I think the flip side of that is that sometimes fear can be like a virus. It can be something that starts with one person and it just spreads. It goes from person to person all the way around causing problems and chaos and havoc as it goes. Um, if I'd have been doing that writing exercise, uh, the one that we're kind of going to do here, my thing for the top box would have been a very, very easy choice. Um, because my biggest fear throughout my uh, childhood and actually in, into a section of my adulthood was needles. Now, I'm pretty sure that the root of this fear came from two separate occasions. Now, one of these was when I was uh, four years old. <coughs> Did anyone happen to see uh, a film called House on the Witch Pit that played here a few years ago? Yeah. He wrote that. 
Hmm. He did. Confusing isn't the same as clever. I didn't know what to tell you that. Oh, piss off. I'm trying to set a mood. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> completely forgot what I was saying. No. Um, yeah, two incidents with needles. Uh, the first was when I was four. I apparently had an allergic reaction to an injection. I don't really remember this, but I was told it by my family, and I think because of that, it sat in my head. I always thought of myself as someone with a bad relationship with needles, because I'd been kind of told that throughout my childhood. And the second one, I will talk you through. Um, 1987. Schools at that point had compulsory TB jabs for the students. Some of you may have suffered this situation, um, and before the TB jab, as you may remember, they gave you a little tester. They give you a little round stabby thing, horrible little bastard, uh, that would like that, like a, a stamp from hell on your arm, a uh, little circle thing, and it was to check whether you were going to have an allergic reaction. Now, as I said, I'd been kind of preloaded with the idea that I was going to have, uh, because I'd kind of grown up with this whole idea of, all right, when I was four, I had a bad reaction or something. So, all right, picture the scene. In 1987, a classroom in Essex, uh, you've got all these kids sitting there, and a, a, a student who's just had this um, tester on his arm starts to feel unhappy, starts to feel uh, queasy, passes out, passes out, passes out sideways, hits the wooden floor, wets himself in front of the class. Now, I probably don't need to tell you who that kid was, um, maybe I do. It was a kid called Keith. Um, <laughs> he sat behind me, and so so I saw Keith on the floor, and I went. <laughs> I, actually, I didn't laugh, um, not because I had any semblance of human empathy, uh, because if you've ever met a thirteen-year-old boy, <laughs> forget about that. The reason that I didn't laugh at Keith on the floor was I was way too busy thinking, "It's going to be me next. It's going to be me next." All the blood drained out of my face. They took me to see like the school nurse because uh, I was convinced I was about to pass out as well. And as a result, they delayed my injection. And that just made it worse, because that meant that I had another couple of weeks to psych myself up for it. It meant I couldn't go with all my friends. It meant that suddenly, again, I was a person with a weird reaction, or at least relationship, with needles. Uh, and so the only way I got through the entire process was by mentally playing uh, the Bruce Willis album, The Return of Bruno, on like a mental loop in my brain because it was 1987 and that was the closest thing to call we had so please don't judge me but the whole process really really left a mental scar and from that point on I would always go right one of you subjects has a piece of paper with a drawing in the top right hand corner it is a drawing of a walrus yes a walrus if you're holding that piece of paper hold it up high and speak I said speak. Hmm. If the person answered correctly and in time, they may take a sweetie from the sweetie box. Nice like that. If they didn't, tear that piece of paper up and throw it away. It wasn't even your fear, was it? It was someone else's. And now their fear isn't part of the game anymore. I hope you feel awful. <laughs> or alternatively, I hope you're enjoying your poison, sweetie. <laughs> so, so uh, alright, so the needles thing. I found that uh, actually by going back, revisiting those two experiences, picking it apart, like kind of reverse engineering it, I was able to go, oh, alright, this fear started from this. It then became this because of this. And by taking some time to actually go through it and unpick the experience in my mind, I found I was able to reverse engineer my fear a little bit and actually make it much, much less. Now, this is not, it, this was not a miracle cure. I'm not and will probably never be at the point where I could give blood or get a tattoo, which, which is a real shame because I've heard that when you give blood, they give you a lollipop. Um, but, but no, I'm not at that point, so no lollipops for me. Uh, but I am at the point now where I would maybe be able to, you know, have an injection before going on foreign holidays and stuff like that. So that was good and it was useful. Um, before we go on and talk about other uh, stuff that freaked me out as a kid, because this is cheaper than therapy, um, I want to talk about a way to use fear positively. Can I hear, just by a round of applause, who has to write anything uh, in the course of their, their working time, particularly stuff to a deadline? Creativity, anything. By a round of applause, please, folks. Oh, brilliant. 
Got a load of writers here. Excellent. Okay, this is my way of using fear in a positive way, and it's called a Ulysses Pact. Some of you may have already heard of this. Uh, if you haven't, Ulysses from great, uh, from great mythology. <laughs> it was great, that mythology. <laughs> Ulysses from Greek mythology um, was in a situation where he needed to sail his ship through an area that was inhabited by the sirens. And what the sirens did was they sang this impossibly beautiful song, and it made sailors crash their ships onto the rocks. So the term a Ulysses Pact comes from the fact that Ulysses wanted to do three things. He wanted to sail his ship through that area. He didn't want to go nuts and crash the ship, but he also wanted to hear the song. So he planned ahead. He planned in advance for everything that was going to happen. What he did was he lashed himself to the post in the ship. He plugged up all of his crew's ears with wax so they couldn't hear it, told them to sail straight ahead, not change direction no matter what, and never to let him go no matter what. So he stood there ranting and raving and wanting to crash the ship and couldn't, and so he got everything he wanted by planning ahead. And the way that I think writers can use this is by planning for the slackness of your future self by injecting a little note of fear into it. What I recommend is you get a crisp 20 pound note, you put that in an envelope, you give that to a friend that you trust, and you tell them that if on a particular deadline you do not email them the completed document they are to pay that £20 note into a cause that you find abhorrent. <laughs> now, I can't always motivate myself, but if I thought £20 of my money was going to the Daily Mail, <laughs> I would complete that script for Squid Slayer. It would happen. Um, I, love, I love the Ulysses Pact as, an, as a way of turning fear to an advantage. It's like a positive use. So... Um, Having picked apart my needle phobia, not enough, uh, as I say, for tattoos or for blood giving, so no lollipops for me, uh, but I found that it helped, so I wondered what other fears or irrational weirdness I had that I could look at and examine and revisit uh, and maybe do something about. And the next one that I found was barbers. Now, I've always had a weird, unsettled feeling in barbers and hairdressers. Uh, I think part of that is a kind of natural grief process that as you sit and watch your own face for half an hour, uh, you know, the aging process, you, it, you can't ignore every line that sort of cropped up on your face from every sort of hour misspent in front of glowing screens or uh, failed schemes. But, but that's not all of it. The, my fear of barbers was deeper rooted and so... All of you, speak. I said all of you. You have a piece of paper with a fear written on it. Now look at the second panel. In that, you are going to write a job that is related in some way to the fear. For example, if your fear is donkeys, you will write zookeeper or something like that. So, write your job and then pass it to the next person. Write, pass, you'll get the hang of it. Hopefully. So yeah, whatever that fear is in the top box, think of a job that could be connected to that fear and write that in the second box and then pass them around, please folks. Pass them around. Oh, it's the other movie. I, I kept hearing like little voices. I was like, am I finally losing it? Oh, it's only me that can hear it. Oh, damn it. Um, <laughs> All right, so uh, while you guys, uh, actually it looks like people seem to have finished, which is brilliant. Um, I, that fear of barbers that I referred to had a particularly awful payoff for me as a kid because my fear of barbers meant that I acted up when I was taken into hairdressers and uh, one time I acted up so badly that my mum unleashed the ultimate 1980 punishment, which was that she didn't let me watch my favourite TV show. I know, because um, the thing is now, that's no punishment at all. You can watch it on iPlayer, you can watch it on DVD, you can catch it. Back then, if you missed it, it was gone forever. And I acted up so badly in a barber's that I wasn't allowed to watch the episode of Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World that was on that night. And it was the episode about Bastard Bigfoot as well, and I've been looking forward to it for weeks. 
and I wasn't allowed. So, uh, so obviously, to prevent myself <laughs> acting up in barbers in future, I thought it would be good uh, to unpick. I still haven't seen the Bigfoot episode of Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, but I have now revisited the thing that made me scared of barbers in the first place. And this particular set of footsteps leads back to the two Ronnies. Now, <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, for anyone who is uh, too young to remember the two Ronnies, the two Ronnies were a TV sketch show, and on one occasion, um, they had a sketch that was a parody of the Sondheim musical Sweeney Todd. And in this sketch, you had Ronnie Barker dressed up as Mrs. Lovett, you know, in dress, and you had uh, Ronnie Corbett and Little Ginger Wick, and they were slitting people's throats and turning them into meat pies, which wasn't the normal stuff that you saw <laughs> on the two Ronnies. It really wasn't. And, and even now, even uh, at the point I tried to track this down, because I thought, okay, you know, if I'm confronting fears from my childhood, I need to kind of work this out. At the point I tried to track it down, you couldn't get it on DVD. Now you can, but if you go and get it on DVD, that sketch is so much stronger than anything else, and it shows kind of how out of keeping it is with everything else, that that disc is a higher rating than the nine seasons of the two Ronnies that went before it. So it was tonally weird, uh, and revisiting it, it, as a kid it absolutely scared the beans out of me, but as an adult I found it uh, a useful experience, that I was able to kind of visit it, um, and, uh, excuse me just a sec. Uh, yeah, so as I say, I was able to revisit it, I was able to process it as an adult rather than as a child, uh, and in the process, unpick it and massively reduce my irrational fear of hairdressers and my equally irrational terror of Ronnie Corbett. Um, okay, a lot of this stuff, um, it's slightly weird to kind of note this, particularly given the theme of today's show, but a lot of this stuff is not about movies. A lot of this stuff is about TV. Um, it, there's a thing I'm going to mention in a bit that's about comics, the stuff in real life. But the reason for this was that when I was a kid, I never watched horror movies. Can I, I, I think this kind of... Can, I, can we do this by a round of applause? How many people watched horror movies as a kid, like when you were a proper kid? <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. And how many didn't? Okay. okay, so we've got more people who did than didn't. And I think either way... Um, that can be one of the real things that leads us through to this love of the genre, this real interest in it. Because I, I built up in my head, I was an imaginative kid, I was always full of ideas and stuff, and I built up in my head that horror movies would be so unimaginably terrifying that there was no way I'd watch them. I don't think I even thought they had narrative. I, think they would, I thought they were just a succession of images, uh, and so I never wanted to see any horror movies. But what I did see was the posters. And the posters left marks again. Um, there were three in so, Does one of you have in the fear box the word spiders? Anyone? If so, tear that up, throw it away. That's not in the game anymore. Only knobs are afraid of spiders. <laughs> Okay, um, there was a, hey, oh, you probably threw that in the air like at the end of the Goonies, I love it. Um, one more of the things that terrified me as a kid, and this was an image that I just couldn't shift out of my brain. This was an image of a stage magician, and the stage magician is standing and he's levitating a volunteer from the audience and this volunteer from the audience is actually physically levitating but his head has come off and his eyes are glassy and dead and his arms have removed and his legs have removed and he's floating in the air all kind of dismembered and there's text over the top and the text says murder magic and it's written it's got like polka dots on bubbled balloon text and there's someone in the audience who's standing up and pointing at this magician and saying that's not an illusion you've killed him and that image I can remember where it was when I saw that I was sitting in a car um, outside a newsagent and my mum had just bought me an issue of Spider-Man pocketbook and I'd opened the comic and I'd seen that image 
and it absolutely wrecked me. Something about it absolutely descended into my darkest subconscious and I couldn't shift it. I, as a kid, I freaked, I threw the comic book away. So I was only ever in possession of this comic book for maybe six minutes. Uh, from when we bought it to when I, we tore it up and my mum was like, no, no, it's fine. And we tore it up and threw it away. Um, but I couldn't ever shift the image. The image was still there. And then as I got to be an adult, I thought, that's got no place in a Spider-Man comic. I couldn't work out what the hell that was. And so I turned to the 21st century oracle of Google and you kind of go, all right, this will give me some answers. And so I Google Spider-Man murder magic and I get nothing. And I Google Spider-Man stage magician, you've killed him and get nothing. And then you start to think, maybe this was like a dream. It's really hard to tell with some of the stuff from when you're a kid. So I started looking on eBay and I'm trawling through on eBay trying to find this comic because even though I only owned it for six minutes and the front image was really generic it's a really generic Spider-Man image and I still thought it's okay it's a Spider-Man pocketbook it was called it was from about 1980 so these were British reprints and I go through on eBay and then one day I thought I think that's it I was about 50-50 tops but I thought I think that's it and so I ordered it and at the point it arrived at the point the package arrived I was suffering the worst fever of my adult life. You know those fevers that just get inside you and just mess with you? So I was laid up in bed, I was feverish, I was confused, I was borderline delirious. This package arrived, tore open the package, opened it, and the picture is exactly as I remembered it from my childhood. And if you have never, as a delirious adult, confronted the source of your terror from childhood, I actually kind of recommend it because what happens is uh, it creates like an adrenaline rush and that creates really strong memory creation and it's like that image has kind of split in two in my memories now. I remember seeing it as a kid but equally I've got equally a strong memory of seeing it as a feverish adult and of course as an adult I was amazed by it but I wasn't scared of it and so somehow I've been able to process that image in a way that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Um, it's not necessarily one that had a huge amount of practical payoff. Um, you know, obviously everyone is slightly scared of being levitated and dismembered. Um, <laughs> but still, I did, I did get, uh, I got on stage as a volunteer with Darren Brown. Uh, and I figured if I still had any semblance of a morbid fear of stage magicians, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So that was my, you know, that's kind of at least overcoming that to a degree. So um, I'd found that two for two, I had found that confronting stuff from when I was a kid uh, and picking it apart had been incredibly useful. Indian host, cease your babbling and listen. Life can be hard, can't it? Harder for some more than others. Subjects. In the third box, I would like you to write something, I don't know, like a drawback, like an addiction, or a flaw, like selfishness or being a prick. Write that in there, pass it on, you know the drill. So, a character flaw, some kind of drawback. Something that people would find a drawback in their everyday life. So insomnia or something like that. Uh, if you can get that uh, down on the paper. And then pass the pages around. That would be fantastic. I still feel bad about the ones that got torn up. <laughs> it's like, I really do. Okay. Three for three. From everything that I've talked about so far, I found it a really useful experience to go back, revisit stuff that scared beans out of me as a kid, unpick it as an adult. And you see, the thing is that as an adult, I found that not only could I overcome any of those fears, but I could turn them into a kind of petrol. And in terms of being a screenwriter, I could turn them into abstract imagery that I was able to incorporate into screenplays. 
and then sometimes I could turn those screenplays into money. Um, so winner, winner, and indeed, chicken dinner, as far as that one went. Um, and so I found that a hugely, hugely useful experience, and I thought, what else about my relationship with fear could I pick apart? And I turned my attention to the idea of fear as a virus. The times when I'd possibly let my fears infect other people, the others around me. A few examples of that and maybe some apologies. Quite often when I do talks and public appearances and stuff like that, I finish with the line, my name is Pat Higgins and my conscience is clear. And that isn't always quite as true as I want it to be, so uh, I'll throw out a few public apologies now. The first one of these actually relates to Trash House, um, which I picked up before. Yeah, 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 my first movie. As I said, splattery, stupid midnight movie, really good fun, shot it in a shed in Shubri Ness, came out on DVD. Uh, when Trash House came out on DVD, I got a whole bunch of emails from other filmmakers. Basically, at that point, it was really, really hard to uh, make movies. The act of making movies, just practically, has got much, much simpler. In the year that Trash House came out, there were only uh, 16 UK horror movies commercially released that year. Uh, and nowadays, not necessarily commercially released, but I certainly think more than that get completed each month, let alone kind of each year. So Trash House kind of, I was really lucky because the only reason it got any attention was at the time the marketplace wasn't so crowded. But as digital technology was coming through, people were intrigued by, all right, well, you know, how did this work out? And I got an email from a guy who was making a movie and he said, hello, I liked your film and I saw that it got a big release and stuff, um, or at least relative to it being a tiny little movie. Um, can you maybe give us some advice? Uh, and he was making his own film, and he was shooting his film on 4.3 DV, so square, yeah? Uh, he was shooting his film on 4.3 DV, it was already a big chunk of the way through doing it, and I'd shot Trash House on 4.3 DV as well. I, I kept that quiet, hadn't told anybody that I'd shot it on 4.3 DV, I'd cropped it so that it was into widescreen, but in terms of it, it's, uh, I, I think I used to list it for festivals and stuff, I list it as mixed digital media or something like that that sounded suitably ambiguous. And so I got this email from this dude who was shooting uh, his movie in 4.3 uh, DV and I said, man, you're never going to be able to sell it. I said, you're not going to be able to sell it, not at this particular point. You need to be moving to HD. I was moving to HD for my other movies that I was shooting that year. And, and that was my fear talking. That was, that was me worrying about falling behind. That was me worrying about the idea that my film hadn't been good enough in some ways and I wanted to look like I was at the head of the pack. So the advice that I gave him was bad. I told him that his 4.3 DV wasn't good enough for 2005 or wherever we were. Um, and that was bad, bad advice because as it turned out... Is that taking that down? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, it means the scissors man will be quieter. But um, anyway, <laughs> um, anyway, what I should have said to him was it doesn't matter a damn what format you shoot on, it only matters if the movie's good. Because he sold his movie. Right now, subject closest to the host right this minute, speak. Would you like a sweetie? <laughs> now, take that piece of paper. Oh, do you have the piece of paper closest to you at this point? Yes. Good. Read aloud their greatest fear. Small spaces on the ground. That's their greatest fear. Yes. What a baby. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> except perhaps hearing the most terrifying movie picture of all time. If I were to hear that, then you lot would win. But I'm quite confident I'm not going to hear that today. Now, subject, <laughs> on the uh, last box in your piece of paper, write down a bad life decision, such as, I don't know, gambling all your money away, or perhaps sitting down to watch strippers versus werewolves. Strippers versus werewolves is still such an open wound that I actually, I tend to bring, out of the DVDs to represent all the stuff, I tend to bring the Japanese version instead, which is called Monster Night, and so people look at it and don't know what the movie is. Anyway, um, where were we? Oh yeah, I was saying to Mark um, that his format was no good, I was saying to Mark not to, uh, that that wouldn't be good enough, and what happened was he sold his movie, it came out, it got a cinema release 
all over the world, uh, and he'd shot it for 45 quid. The first time I saw it uh, was it projected onto a sheet in a room above a pub. Second time I saw it was in a sold out West End screening. He's a dude called Mark Price. He's brilliant. Uh, if you haven't seen his movie, do look him up online. But it was my bad advice because I, I had format fear. Uh, and I'm so glad that I didn't spread that fear on to Mark. Because the first time I saw him was in that room above a pub. Next time I saw him was on Sky News. So I'm so sorry. Mark, I'm sorry, man. Um, for giving you bad advice because of my own fears. Another one, a lecture about uh, screenwriting and idea generation. Uh, I spend a lot of my time doing that. And a student of mine, uh, this is a good few years ago, a student of mine followed my career with a lot of interest and he tweeted at a celebrity who'd just been cast in a script that I'd sold. Uh, just sort of saying, you know, he was just enthusiastic, he was just sort of saying, um, you know, oh, you're, you're appearing in a movie that my teacher wrote. Um, and all this sort of thing, and he was just happy and excited about it, and I told him not to, and I suggested it wasn't appropriate, and I suggested it wasn't professional, and again, that was my fear, that was me kind of feeling like a fraud in the first place, and feeling quite like, you know, oh wow, you know, actually there are people being cast in this stuff, and I didn't want to look over... Ha! They're back! And sooner than expected. Many people apologise when they come too soon, but I am proud of it. <laughs> I am the scissors man. Speak, all of you. Oh. Take a look at the job you wrote in the second box. You are now going to write something creepy that could happen on an average day in that job. For example, if you wrote Zookeeper, you might now write something like Finding All the Animals Dead. <laughs> write it down now. I'm going to stare at you while you write, just to make you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so, something creepy that could happen on a day at the job listed in the second box. So something creepy that could potentially happen, uh, like yeah, if you're if it was a doctor, then maybe uh, having a patient die on the couch. If it was a, as he said, zookeeper finding the animals dead, something like that that might be a kind of trigger point for a deeper, darker story. That's what we need to do. Anyway, I was apologising to uh, I was apologising I was apologising to my student Dan. Uh, my reason for apologising to Dan is because I told him not to uh, try and reach out to these celebrities. A couple of years later, he ended up being the celebrity liaison officer for uh, one of the biggest production companies in this country. <laughs> Reaching out to celebrities was his, his greatest gift in this world, and I almost stomped on it. His whole job now is just greeting A-list celebrities, making them feel at home, dealing with them on a daily basis. So, Dan, I'm sorry, man, because uh, I should never have let my fear of embarrassment overpower uh, what was your gift and your skill. Sometimes, sometimes I think it, some things, it wouldn't even occur to us that they might be difficult until someone actually points out to us that this is something to be scared of or something to worry about. Uh, when my daughter was five, she said to me, uh, Dad, how do you split the atom? Don't worry, I'm not going to do it in the kitchen. <laughs> One more apology, one more apology, and this is an old mate of mine called Mark, uh, and if anyone was trying to follow what the lie in this whole thing that I've been talking about, what the lie was, if you were wondering, well maybe he has diplomatically changed the names of all the people in this section, no, I'm not that bright, uh, and even if I was, I wouldn't have changed two of them to Mark, because that's just weird and confusing, so no, that's not... That's not the thing. This is definitely uh, a genuine guy. This guy was the best blagger I ever met. I don't know if any of you have friends like this. People who can just sort of um, blag anything. He blagged us backstage tickets to a band that we loved. We loved this band so much. And he blagged us after show tickets. This is when we were like late teens, early 20s. Um, and so we got back and we got drunk. And we had a brilliant, brilliant night. And so we're there in this backstage party. And Mark says to me, and I'm going to go and talk to the band. And I said, no, man, don't do it. I physically tried to actually hold him back from it. I said, man, don't go and talk to the band. Don't go and do that because don't meet your heroes and you're going to ruin the night. If they tell you to piss off or something, that's going to be what we'll remember. And we've had this brilliant, lovely evening. Don't do it. Don't go and talk to the band. And he physically pushed me away and he went and talked to the band and he started a friendship, and over the years that followed, he became their manager. So by the point later on, when they were playing Brixton Academy, 5,000-seater 
uh, 5,000 venue. He was the one who was organising the entire gig and having to deal with over-enthusiastic fans like he'd already been. So he actually, you know, thank God. Again, all it would have taken was me to successfully stop him. And that whole thing would never have happened. He'd have never got that job. So, um, again, sorry, Mark. And thank God your enthusiasm was strong enough to get through my fears. And thank God the beer was strong enough as well. The beer, <laughs> not enough can be said for how much the beer helped him overcome um, that situation. So I think that's it for apologies. Oh, actually, um, just one more. Uh, if anybody has paid money for um, strippers versus werewolves, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry? It wasn't my. Well, I can't say that. I, 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 but yeah. um, <laughs> no one ever sets out to make a bad movie. No one ever sits down and goes, you know, I'm going to spend months, maybe years of my life making something that will unite everyone going, what an atrocious piece of shit you've made. No one sets out to do that. It kind of happens through a series of different things. I think. My hope is just that, what, that that unifying force could be possibly the, the positive thing to come out of bad movies. Like that one day you'll get like an email from someone who's going, well, me and my dad have never had anything in common. You know, we disagree about Brexit. We disagree about Trump. But we sat down and watched Strippers vs. Werewolves last night. And we're... <laughs> so, yeah. Um, no one ever sets out to make a bad movie, but we do sometimes. It, it does just sort of happen. Um... The, I'm aware as well that this this particular uh, show, for want of a better masterclass, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. Maybe you could tell me. I don't know. Um, but this particular one has kind of strayed off the beaten track a little bit because, as I say, it's like... We're now talking worst case scenarios, like the apocalypse. or taking this fucking job. <laughs> right. Look back at the fear that's written on your piece of paper. Got it? Now, I'd like you to consider what would happen if the things in that fear were to win. Maybe it's snakes running amok across the whole world. Sounds like a lovely to me, actually. Just write down the worst case scenario of that fear. In your own time. Okay, we've got uh, just over five minutes uh, until the Scissors Man comes back. Uh, and so, the worst case scenario for that fear running amok, if you can get that down, uh, on the piece of paper, that would be amazing. Uh, once we've actually got that, I think we need to kind of collect these up. Paul, are you in a position where you can grab these, man? Yeah. That would be fantastic. So once you've finished and you've got your worst case scenario on there, um, give it to Paul, who doesn't look familiar in any way. <laughs> okay, just to quickly explain what we're going to do with these, um, I'm going to take all these bits. I, I've kind of some of you may have even seen on previous shows, we've, I've talked about using a logline template. Now, the template is uh, inspired by uh, the work of Blake Snyder. If anyone's read Blake Snyder, he's written a book called Save the Cat. Uh, it wrote, what should I say, he's unfortunately no longer with us. Um, but in that book, there's a thing called the turbocharged logline. And that turbocharged logline takes all the things that you might need to put together a pitch for the most terrifying movie in the world. Oh, it still does work. Fantastic. Um, so, so let me give you an example. Hang on, how long have we got? All right, I've got like oh, four and a half minutes until the system man comes back. Okay, I, I know what time he comes back. <laughs> I've got inside information. Um, yeah, I know. Cheap. Um, okay, so, for example, we've got here slimy things, slugs, worms, etc. We've then got the job as being an exterminator. We've then got that personal flaw as being, or uh, disadvantage, as being uh, drink and drugs. Uh, and we've got a swarm of dangerous uh, long bugs? Large bugs. Lo what bugs? Large, big. Oh, large. Oh, okay. A swarm of dangerous large bugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then we've got, they eat us all slowly, as the worst case scenario. Um, and then we've got driving, uh, driving under the influence and getting arrested, which is the bad life decision. Yeah, so we've got all those here. So the way that you'd string that together as a pitch, as I will do when he pops back, um, is on the brink of driving under the influence and getting arrested, a drink and drugs addicted exterminator 
discovers a swarm of dangerous large bugs. And he must learn to overcome his addictions before they eat us all slowly. <laughs> so that's a pitch, right? That's one of them. Uh, oh my God! All right, I, I, I don't know how this stands on copyright stuff. Or if we wait, this one. is Pinocchio out of copyright? He is as a concept. Isn't he? Pinocchio is a fear. He's brilliant. Whoever did that, I'm not going to ask you to identify yourself, but thank you. That's amazing. Um, so we've got Pinocchio. We've got uh, puppets that change position by themselves. Uh, puppeteer, coffee addiction. Uh, Pinocchio turns everyone into puppets that he controls, and suicide by hanging. So, uh, okay, so let's throw that one together. Okay, so we've got on the brink of suicide by hanging, the hanging of the puppeteer. I only just got that, sorry. <laughs> Should have clicked that earlier. Oh, shit, I've only got two and a half minutes. Um, okay, so on the brink of suicide by hanging, a coffee addicted puppeteer discovers puppets who change position by themselves. Um, but when this leads to the discovery of a demonic Pinocchio, uh, the puppeteer must overcome his coffee addiction before Pinocchio turns everyone into puppets that he controls. Yeah. Hey, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, okay, uh, uh, we need three. I've got loads here. This is brilliant. Um, oh, I'm going to just go by the fears. Uh, we've got demonic possession. Um, uh, we've got a monster made of poo. Um, <laughs> I don't know who scared of that, but that, <laughs> oh, oh no, that's I've got to read that out. Hang on. Um, okay, so uh, on the brink of um, falling in to a ship mines, is that no? <laughs> um, <laughs> falling into something on the brink of falling into let's call them ship mines. On the brink of falling into ship mines, um, an obsessive compulsive sewage worker, <laughs> yeah, um, discovers a monster made of poo. Uh, and he must, uh, he must learn to overcome his compulsions before the planet turns to shit. <laughs> okay, so, so we've got that uh, demonic possession. Um, we've got a uh, crazy axe man at the top of the stairs, always a classic. Uh, we've got drowning, we've got small spaces, which the scissors man was very cruel about earlier. Um, we've got nailed to a cross, that's slightly, oh, okay, we've got a carpenter fearing being nailed to a cross here. I can't see, I can't see the release of this being unproblematic. Uh, um, we've got a giant spider, oh, that one escaped being torn up despite his dislike of spiders. Uh, we've got massive fleshies and monsters, we've got ghosts, and we've got a ghost buster in there. Uh, oh, okay, that actually just seems to be the plot of Ghostbusters here. We've got <laughs> excellent stuff. Um, we've got traps inside a washing machine. Uh, oh, I like that, actually. Oh, I like that. Um, on, uh, on the brink of, of uh, hang on, what was it? On the brink of getting an office job, hey, a washing machine repairman um, discovers a head in one of the machines. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, and this leads uh, to him becoming trapped. Right. Huh? All of you, eyes here, speak. Oh, oh yes, this is man. It's home time, Belens. <laughs> it's the time of your reckoning. The doomsday clock is at 12 or something. But it's over. Clearly, despite all your scrabbling and your feeble ideas, you won't even come close to coming up with a terrifying movie pitch. I think I've won. But just to humor you, let's have some of these read out. Host, have you got three decent ones? I've got loads of decent ones, scissors man, too many. <laughs> and can you read? Yes. Because I'm not confident at this stage that you can write. <laughs> Go for it. First one. Okay, uh, on the brink of suicide, a sewage worker uh, discovers a monster made of poo um, and must overcome his obsessive compulsions before the entire planet yeah. turns to shit. Oh shit! Yes, it was! <laughs> Another one. Okay, um, on, the, on the brink of suicide by hanging, a coffee addicted puppeteer. Uh, discovers the existence of puppets that change position by themselves uh, and must overcome yeah, his addiction. Not bad. Fair now, but still terrible. Come on, let's get this over with. Read the third one. Um, on the brink of buying a used car from an escaped serial killer, 
A vet with sweaty palms discovers an animal that he put down that comes back to life. When this leads to the discovery of the ter terrifying threat of werewolves, he must overcome his addictions before no one can go out on the full moon. Where did you get that from? Who told you? I have never heard something so terrifying in my life. That might legitimately be the most terrifying movie pitch I've ever heard. How? How have you defeated me? God, this is embarrassing. And, oh God, what's happening to me? You've, you've attacked my very physical form. I am melting. The form of my own melting mind. What? No! Ah! Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Cousins was your scissors man. Okay, um, so what was the lie? I told you guys that I would throw a lie in somewhere along the line, um, and that's exactly what I did. Look, I know everyone loves a big show-stopping ending, yeah? Um, we always want something memorable to go home with, and you know that point where I said uh, that I'd overcome my needle phobia, uh, but not to the point where I could like give blood or get a tattoo? Well, wouldn't it be amazing if, at this point, I removed my shirt? That's enough in itself, isn't it? Come on! <laughs> um, at this point, I removed my shirt, and I had a mural across my back, featuring all of the fears that we talked about that I have overcome. If I had the levitating person with the stage magician, if I had that on my back, if I had the two Ronnies slitting people's throats, and if I had the needles and all that stuff, wouldn't that be an amazing way to end the show? It would be really, really great. So, I haven't. Um, I haven't got a tattoo. Uh, thing is, I'm, 42, I'm 43 years old, and um, although my needle phobia has been overcome, uh, I don't really want one nowadays. Because it feels like the moment's gone and my kids would point and laugh at me when I went swimming. And, and maybe that's a different fear. Maybe that, that's a different fear and I swap one for the other and maybe that's kind of okay. Um, so I haven't got a tattoo. But I have got a fucking lollipop <laughs> because last month I gave blood. And, you know what I found out? I found out they don't give you lollipops. They give you biscuits. So I bought my own. My name's Paget. And my conscience is clear. Thank you.